This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. of the Jacobsonian interpretation of shifters and deictics with reference to examples of city poetry by Jacobson himself and his pseudonym Al Yagrov, Alan Fisher, David Jones and if there's time this author Mary Coghill. The history of how shifters became a part of deictic expression and how Jacobson preserves them as a separate category will be discussed. The formless use of literariness as a means to uncover the science of poetics will be explored. The discussion is developed here with reference to city poetry, suggesting there needs to be a close analysis of shifters and deictics in order to register the balancing of the self with the city, the personal shifter versus the deictics of place and time within a city poetic. There follows a brief look at the life and work of Roman Jacobson. Roman Jacobson was born in 1896 in Moscow and died in 1982 in America. His early studies included the study of art, as well as literature and language, its history and development. His interest in comparative studies of different languages led him to become a leading member of the Moscow Linguistic Circle. The Russian formalists and the futurist movement in Russia formed his ideas, and which, later in his career, informed his interest in semiotics as well as linguistics. He left Russia in 1920 and was made a professor at Masaryk University, Bruno, in 1933. In 1926, he helped to found the Prague School of Linguistic Theory, which also included René Wallach. He maintained contact with many friends in Russia, including Vladimir Markovsky, the poet. He also visited Russia a number of times later in his life. He left Czechoslovakia in 1938 and after living in Denmark for a short time, studying with him, Helmslev, he left Europe for America, which became his permanent home. He was appointed a professor at Harvard University in 1949. He wrote his essays and papers in various languages, including Russian, Czech, French and English, and many of these essays have also been translated into different languages. It is one such paper which is the focus of this seminar today. This paper was originally written in English in the 1950s and published in the UK in 1971 entitled Two Aspects of Language and Two Types of Aphasic Disturbances. This had also... This paper is entitled Shifters, Verbal Categories and the Russian Verb. It was published again in 1984. This paper has received a certain amount of attention over the years but in the current work on deictics it is seldom mentioned. It is important to understand how his theories came about and how they have been interpreted, reinterpreted and or sidelined. Jacobson has his enthusiastic followers who include Chapman, Jeanette, Nairne, Cinnamon and Moore, and there are those who are cautious about his work, though enthusiastic, Richard Curitan for example, and his detractors, Culler and Friedlich, to name some of the most well known. Jacobson was a semiotician as well as a linguistician. He lamented that linguistics failed to embrace the breadth of the patterns of language that poetry uses. He urged linguisticians to extend their interest to the semiotic interpretation of language patterns that would enable them to include a comprehensive study of poetry. This does not seem to have happened. It is largely accepted that his linguistic analysis arose from an important essay which was written in English in 1960 entitled Linguistics and Poetics. A close study of his work, however, reveals that his interest in semiotics arose from his interest in art from the very earliest days of his academic career. It is not the purpose of this paper to investigate what is the most well-known of Jacobson's work, his theory of poetic function, um, from linguistics and poetics in language and literature, um, and I'll just read it, the poetic function projects the principle of equivalence from the axis of selection into the axis of combination. 
All too often this significant theory becomes the one thing that is studied and yet is often not properly understood without considering Jacobson's commitment to Russian formalism, the formalist understanding of function and the central precept of literariness. The formalists, with their interest in structure, understood that the artefact exists as something which has its own attributes and properties and that these are available in themselves for study and analysis. This is a fundamental precept which is derived from the Aristotelian empirical desire for the for observed knowledge and which has been used throughout the centuries to inform scientific observation. The formalists wish to apply science to language and with the use of linguistics construct a science of poetics. This has been called into question especially by the post-structuralists with their emphasis on the reader's role in the control of the artifact's meanings. And for this see Color, 2002. Vladimir Alexandrov summarises the history of the development of the idea of literariness in his paper Literature, Literariness and the Brain in 2007, and I quote, Jacobson's focus on literariness, or on what makes an utterance literary, both reflects and is a major contribution to the central idea of 20th century Slavic literary theory, which begins with the Russian formalists, includes the Prague structuralists, and culminates in the Moscow Tartu school of semiotics, especially its most visible representative, Yuri Lotman. The formalist use of the word function, and again see Jacobson's central definition, with its particular formalist meaning, is also important for constructing the science of poetics, the literariness. Osterwalder's work in 1978 on T.S. Eliot concentrates on the metaphoric and metonymic poles of language rather than Jacobson's theory of poetic function and the construction of space between the poles or axes. But his work remains important because of his central emphasis on the encoder orientation of this modernist poet. Osterwalder's emphasis on the poet's relationship with the poetic message as one whereby the poet provides a controlling force for this poetic message, is crucial in accepting that not only does Jacobson's theory state that poetry is a message which concentrates on the message for its own sake, but also that the formalist definition of function can include the communication role of the poet, where this role releases information about the structure and literariness of the text. Osterwalder's emphasis does two things. Firstly, it describes how the strength of the poetic function is a process of communication from the poet to the, and the text to the reader, and secondly, it produces a strong poetic space which can be realised by a constructed axial model based on the poles of language. The study of the poles of language is another of Jacobson's important theoretical contributions to literary analysis, second only to his definition of poetic function. These poles are an exploration of the metaphoric and metonymic tropes in both poetry and prose. This analysis arises from Jacobson's interest in aphasia. His paper on this was published in 1956 entitled Two Aspects of Language and Two Types of Aphasic Disturbances. He has written this in the early 1930s. Jacobson's analysis of the poles of language deserves investigation in their own right and will not be specifically explored in this paper. Literariness is therefore the study of the text itself, and it uses the science of language to inform the analysis which is made of the literary work under examination. Literariness proposes that there is a scientific basis for language, that there is a linguistic, and for Jacobson also a semiotic, basis for the structure of both poetic language and prose, both spoken and written and that it was, the o- was only the investigative study of specific examples which would reveal the full scientific structure of the poetry or prose. Any attempt to unlock the secrets of the literature through recourse to biographical material or context of place and or time was considered to be a false premise. He used this system to study and analyse poems by, amongst others, Baudelaire, Blake, Poe, Shakespeare and Yeats. It has been painstakingly developed with reference to free verse by Christine Brooke Rose in her analysis of Ezra Pound's Usura Canto. If this kind of analysis is combined with the Russian formalist use of the terms function and projection included in the definition of poetic function, then the theory for the analysis of patterns of poetic language, whether it be in poetry or prose, becomes fully developed. 
apologies are due for spending so much time on a brief introduction to Jacobson's work, but given the recent neglect of his theories of language structure, a very short resume seems essential. Before any more of the theories explored, please turn to the examples given of poetry written by Jacobson himself, included in the handout, Distraction and How Many Fragments Are Scattered. These poems were written when he was a young man, and his entire output is very small. He adopted the pseudonym Alyagrov, a name which in Russian includes a coded reference to his own self. The poetry which has been translated by Stephen Rudy is available in My Futurist Years, published in 1992, and here is a short quote. For lovers of coloured cardboard boxes and powdered elements, the city, a lamppost, the streets, din, and a car's horn, the door for rooms, etc. Along their shattered nerves like words or crazy verses, jungling, juggling the intersections, the city's nights dance. No city. It's just an absence of blue ley lines. It blows eveningly and windily. Oh, you city ensued inhumanly. One of the themes of this seminar is poetry of the city. This extract is from a city poem. Markovsky, Jacobson's friend and contemporary, also wrote city poetry, although his relationship with the city seems to be often negative. An early poetic image by Mayakovsky is that he, quote, goes out through the city, leaving his soul on the spears of the houses, shred by shred. Although the early years of the 20th century was a prolific and exciting artistic time in Russia, the futurist relationship which poets had with the city is perhaps less sympathetic than artistic representations of the time. And I'm showing a picture by Elena Guro, um, who had a particular uh, interest in portraying windows where the um, atmosphere of the city seems somehow to loom larger than the contents of the room inside the window. She explores this a number of times in her work. And then there's Olga Ros Rosanova, and this is City on Fire. She was a contemporary of um, Jacobson. And, um, uh, she, um, and uh, Jacobson printed a collection of verse with her called Gniga, um, um, the title of which is a pun on the word book and gnat in Russian. Jacobson argues, quoting Klednikov, that it's not new subject matter that defines genuine innovation, but he acknowledges the impact of the city, writing in the same essay that the city offers material that fits neatly the structure of the verbal paradox and similar structures. Urbanism offers opportunities for the application of a number of poetic devices, hence the urban verses of Mayakovsky and Klebnikov. The poet and writer Klebnikov, a contemporary a colleague of Jacobson, personified the city in the following way. There's a certain fat gourmand who's fond of impaling human hearts on his spit and who derives a mild enjoyment from the sound of hissing and breaking as he sees the bright red drops falling into the fire and flowing down, and the name of that fat man is the city. This is a more Shelian interpretation of Marinetti's futurist theories, which were also um, of great interest to uh, Jacobson and his colleagues. And the following quote is from one of Marinetti's manifestos. And Marinetti writes, We shall sing of the great crowd, crowds tossed about by work of pleasure or revolt, the many-coloured and polyphonic surf of revolutions in modern capitals, the nocturnal vibration of the arsenals and the yards under their violent electric moons, the gluttonous railway stations small, swallowing smoky serpents, the factories hung from the clouds by the ribbons of their smoke, the bridges leaping like athletes hurled over the diabolical cutlery of sunny rivers. If you combine this awareness of urbanism with futurism, then the background dynamics of futurist verse become clearer. Jacobson's poem, How Many Fragments, is referred to by Jacobson himself many years later as an oblique satire on Markovsky's urban poetry. Its overall mood is for both rapid movement and negative dissociation between the human and the power of the city. It is referred to here as it provides an example of how city poetry has an affinity to the use of dialectics, and perhaps in this instance, to a lesser extent, the shifters. The examination of how many fragments begins with analysis of the shifters in the poem. 
The first line, for lovers of coloured cardboard boxes, is arguably a vocative line containing a hidden shifter, which might well be expressed as, oh, you lovers of cardboard boxes. Then line three, you've got along their shattered nerves, which is almost certainly a reference to the lovers in the first line, although it may describe the attributes of the street. And the reference is combined with the dialectic along, which describes both place and movement in one word. The fragmented gra- grammar provides another dissociative technique. The association between the lovers, streets and nerves is indirect and blurred, ensuring that the reader associates the nerves with the lines or the streets of the city, as well as with human nervous sensation. Jacobson's literariness requires that the grammar and linguistics are used as a foundation for the interpretation of the text. In this poem, especially given that it is a futurist poem, the parts of speech can be difficult to interpret, and any subsequent errors are mine. There is a shift in line six, that's us, and subsequent shifters occur towards the end of the poem. There's your, uh, the fifth line from the end, and you in the last line, which is also a vocative use of the pronoun. And it's interesting to note that vocatives are defined by Jacobson as decoder-oriented, that is, oriented towards the reader. Well, what is a shifter? The study of shifters and dialectics includes important work by Bueller, of which more later in the paper, but here the work by Jacobson is the source of this analysis. As mentioned, this is based on his chapter, Shifters, Verbal Categories in the Russian Verb. His theory of shifters interprets the spoken word and the first and second person person pronouns. Critics of his theory have pointed out that he does not therefore consider that his analysis of shifters applies to the written word. This is a significant point. As a context for reference, Katie Wales in the Dictionary of Stylistics does not mention shifters, though she summarises with reference to Levinson in her earlier book of 1996, and I quote, Jacobson calls the first person pronoun and the second person pronoun shifters. In French, the word is embrayeur, since their reference are not fixed or stable, but shift according to the situation as participants take turns to speak. Speakers become addressees and vice versa, and the use of the first person pronoun or the second person pronoun is therefore essentially context dependent. The further context on how the analysis of dialectics has developed to include shifters, please, you need to look also at the work of Jonathan Culler and Monica Fludenick. Jonathan Culler omits shifters completely in his work in 19, 2002 and attaches them to dialectics. Fundamentally, a dialectic is an adverb of time or place, but complexities arise as, can be, as will be demonstrated below. Within this definition, various functions have been identified, the most important attribute attribute being that of having a pointing function. As shifters have been included with dialectics, this results in prioritising the pointing characteristic of the personal pronoun, for example, in the sense of you there. Shifters are personal pronouns, I, you, he, she, we, they, and so on. With the possessive adjective, the dialectic component is also apparent, our, their, my, your, their or your has an inherent sense that an item is being placed with a person, as in their book or your sibling. Please note that the third person pronoun has been, has been included in this list. Jacobson had no difficulty in separating the shifter from the dialectic. He refers to the shifter as requiring a context and as having a duplex structure and constructs his definition around the message and the code. Within this, he defines a message message, which is a double M, a code code, which is a double C, a message code, MC, and a code message, CM. And this refers back to his essay, Linguistics and Poetics, which includes his definition of poetic function. Here he explained how the message must be sent from the addresser to the receiver and is decoded by the addressee. Knowledge of Jacobson's theory of communication is probably necessary at this point in order to understand this fourfold duplex equation more fully, but I'm not going to go into the details here. This diagram, which in fact is two Jacobsonian diagrams conflated, is not the subject of this paper, but this slide will give you an indication of important areas of Jacobson's work. 
Jacobson differentiates between the exchangers of the message, the addresser and the addressee, the content or subject matter of the exchange and the type or attributes of the exchange. And the um, type and attributes are in italics. Uh, further information is available later if anybody wants to pursue this, but, but it, it's a large subject on its own. For the purposes of this paper, the type of message is poetic. The term poetic indicates not only poetry but all word patterning, so the type could be prosaic as well as poetic. The message is the words of the text itself, which may also include the spoken word. But here is Jacobson's own defining quotation from his chapter on shifters. A message sent by its addresser must be adequately perceived by its receiver. Any message is encoded by its sender and is to be decoded by its addressee. The more closely the addressee approximates the code used by the addresser, the higher the amount of information obtained, for example, two people speaking the same language, obviously. Both the message, M, and the underlying code, C, are vehicles of linguistic communication, but both of them function in a duplex manner. They may be at once be utilised and referred to, that is pointed out. Thus, a message may refer to the code or to another message, and on the other hand, the general meaning of the code unit may imply a reference to the code or to the message. Accordingly, four duplex types must be distinguished, two kinds of circularity. Message referring to message, this is reported speech, speech within the speech. A code which refers to a code, this is a proper name for example, where someone's name does not, doesn't do anything more than denote a particular person and there's no characteristic implied in the name. Even the name Fido for a dog, the dog himself may not be faithful. Secondly, two kinds of overlapping, message referring to code. This is an autonomous mode of speech. For example, saying that a pup is a young dog is self-referential. And the code referring to the message, and these are the shifters proper, which need the message in order to interpret the code. He places his analysis within the context of speech, uh, which is something which I've already mentioned gives rise to discussion, but it's my personal view that whether the code message is spoken or written is not a problem, especially within the poetic code. Jacobson states that the term shifters originated with Jesperson in 1923. He also refers to Peirce's definition of the personal pronoun as an indexical symbol, and I quote, According to Peirce, a symbol, for example the English word red, is associated with a represented object by a conventional rule, while an index, for example the act of pointing, is in existential relation with the object it represents. Shifters combine both functions and belong therefore to the class of indexical symbols. Jacobson also refers to Buhler's treatment of shifters as mere indices. In other words, the meaning of the personal pronoun is subsumed by its deictic function, its capacity as a pointing word. Jacobson writes, Every shifter, however, possesses its own general meaning. Thus, I means the addresser and you, the addressee, of the message to which it belongs. Jacobson refers to children's acquisition of language in order to illustrate. The difficulties in defining the general meaning of the term I or you which signifies the same intermittent function of different subjects. And actually, I've come across an example where proper nouns are, are confused in the same way. I met somebody and I said to them, I met, I met, you, I met Florrie last week. And she looked extremely puzzled. And she said, who's Florrie? And I said, Florrie is your mother. And uh, she still looked extremely puzzled. And then she said, oh, you mean now? So that it's not just the personal pronouns that can give rise to a shift in nomenclature. It can also, as that example demonstrates. And again, that is the link with children learning about uh, the personal pronouns because she had obviously for years referred to her own mother as Nana in order to explain to her children that that's exactly who she meant. And she, uh, Flory meant nothing to her. <laughs> Jacobson's breadth of the use of different theoreticians also includes references to Husserl and Bertrand Russell. 
So perhaps it's now clear that shifters are indeed a shifting aspect of language function. And it's now also clear that whether the shifter is spoken or used in written speech, it has a function as a shifter. For example, it could be used in reported speech. I'll show you the slide. In my letter to you, I wrote that he told me he was unable to meet her in my apartment at the same time as me. And, um, and which is translated without any thought at all by us as the addressees or the reader as in your letter to me, you wrote that he told you he was unable to meet her in your apartment at the same time as you. It just doesn't cause problems. Does the shifting have a special function in poetry as opposed to prose? This is an important question. As stated at the outset of this paper, shifters are persistently included in the dialectics, and it is interesting to note that Keith Green in his PhD thesis and subsequent, in subsequent articles has argued that there is no specific poetic dialectic by which he means shifters as part of the dialectic category. Uh, I think the debate should be open on this one. Um, before proceeding with further analysis of how many fragments, it will be useful to remember that Jacobson was a linguistician with semiotic leanings. His more semiotic analysis of Blake's poem Infant Sorrow in his essay on the verbal art of William Blake and other poet painters is in contrast with his more linguistic analysis of Yeats' Sorrow of Love. Although Jacobson, quoting Yeats in the introductory paragraph to his analysis of this poem, agrees with Yeats that patterning of words is more important than mere storytelling. Analysis of family fragments is therefore partly one of choice, either to lean towards the linguistics, the linguistic, or to include the linguistic in a more semiotic analysis. Uh, this paper is too brief to provide anything more than an indication of the kind of detailed analysis which Jacobson himself provides of a particular poem. But in the handout, the title of the poem, given that it includes disruption both as a noun, fragments, and as a verb, have scattered, then apart from noting the shifters in this poem, it would seem appropriate to also investigate how these shifters are affected by or influence the nouns and verbs in the poem. Beginning with the title, the patterning of the words and grammar is in itself fragmented. Fragments are, in the usual sense, the result of scattering rather than the cause of it. In the more usual prosaic sense, the title would be how many have scattered fragments. There is an inversion of subject and object, of theme and ream, not into a true passive verb because the inverted object is inanimate. Fragments cannot be the actor, subject, controlling the verb, in this case, have scattered. If the verbs in this poem are categorised, then a pattern begins to emerge. If the verb in the title is past perfect, where else are there verbs in this tense? See line 16, where there is a past perfect question, have flown off the peacock's tail. The meaning here, as in the title, is an inversion of act and action. In a prosaic context, it's probably the peacock that has flown off, not the covers. There are other simple past tense verbs, invaded, destroyed. These are placed centrally in the text of the poem, that's line 12. And sued is in the last line. And the past tenses are, the past tenses are placed at the beginning, middle and end of the poem. Uh, the uh, glued of line 5 appears to be almost an adjectival part of the present participle are turning, which precedes it, although with a comma between the two words, turning, comma, glued, would indicate two verbs placed together, one present participle and one simple past tense. The body of the poem is expressed in the present tense. And Mary, uh, can I interrupt you yes. just to ask something? Yes. What is the date of this poem? It was published about 1921, or earlier in 1916. So it does predate the Waste Man? Oh, yes. Um, I, I, can, I can get you the precise... No, no, no. I mean, mm. it's simply that... Um, <coughs> Um, and the reference to scattered fragments. 
in this world makes me wonder whether I'm clear. Um, he's drawing upon Jacobson's fragments, what I really to, um, or could have known about them. Do we know where it was translated? Well, it was translated by Stephen Rudy, really. Um, I would have been in the 90s, I think. Yes. In it the was, 90s. Yes, yes, it wasn't so, available. It was only available in Russian before so then. It was only available in Russian. So, so they're yes. making, making no connection, no direct connection whatsoever, in which case all I'm doing is, is, uh, is creating a, you know, a false... Unless it's the other way. A false red herring. <laughs> but I, th- I think this may have been written before uh, Jacobson went to Prague. So that would have oh, been yes, before the Oh yes, it was, definitely. definitely. Yeah. Well, that's, that in itself is interesting. Um, because it, it might be interesting in relation to a sort of emerging early 20th century tradition of seeing poetry. Um, and, um, but, sorry, I didn't mean No, no, that's all right. I, I think that it's, it's likely to be generic rather than specific. I thought what was interesting, and I hadn't seen it until just a couple of days ago, the quotation from the um, Futurist Manifesto by Marinetti it had the same inversion of subject and object that was used by Jacobson in this poem. It's not, it's not inverted into a, a passive as such, they just they have somehow reversed the subject and the object and then just written the sentence with the two the wrong way round. And, um, it's possible with T.S. Eliot's connection with Ezra Pound, who had more of a connection well, with the Futurist the, movement. That well, certainly oh, Marinetti's Futurist ma- Manifesto meant a great deal to come, and mm. that was uh, something that um, um, undoubtedly would be the subject of conversation between him and mm. I mean, marriage was, was important to so many parts of the time, yet it's been Right, right. Sorry, I didn't mean to throw you off the that's track. Right. No, I, no, that's quite I just, right. I just needed to get the context clear before, before I got to get it out of my head. Um, no, that's fine, but I, I would say that it's a general link rather than a specific one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now, I've done a very close analysis of all the different verbs in the centre of this poem, and I think at this point, given that there's just the, the three of us here, I won't go into all the um, specific examples. Um, there's present participles, juggling, and dances in the present tense, that's line four, line five, turning, and line six is interesting, coquettes is used as a verb. Um, so that you've got an awful, all the verbs in the centre of the poem are the present tense, and there's one verb tense which indicates a future, and this is the subjunctive in line 13, uh, were, um, as if it were a chimera, which is expressed future wish. The title of the poem, the is run over in line 7, and the gets unstitched in line 9, are all a direct expression of fragmentation, and this is picked up in line 16, have flown off. So the expressed fragmentation is in the passive tense. This increases the sense of disassociation. The question is who is doing the fragmenting, the running over, the unstitching and the flying off? And respectively the answers are the fragments, the truck, the passers-by and the colours. Within this structure the inanimate object, a subject, except for passers-by, renders the human attribute of the passers-by as less animate by association. The central section of this poem contains seven uses of the verbs to be, including the use of becomes and were, and the shifters are placed in the opening line, which is a hidden shifter, and in the last line, where the shifter is open to full view as vocatives. In line three, there, where the exact reference is unclear, does there refer to the lovers or the various features of the city itself in the proximal lines? The us in line six is a pronoun which is overwhelmed by the structure of the line as a whole. Quote, the sun bumps and burn of the sky over as coquettes a skirt screen. And in line 17, your, which is shown in tickets, uh, the placing with the imperative can seem to include a dialectic component, but also serves to disassociate the human within the city environment. The command has no stated operator or subject. Briefly, the nouns in this poem are numerous, forming forming almost one-third of the total word number. Fragmentation governs the structure of this poem. Words which overtly interpret this are the line one, powdered, which also contains perhaps the sense of 
clouded or murky and misty. Line three, shattered and crazy, juggling. Line nine, unstitched. And line 13, chimera. But the chaos is made largely apparent through the interrupted and broken syntax. Sometimes it's difficult to ascertain the part of speech. As in the city, a lamppost, the streets dim. Are there implied commas in this line? Or is there a hidden metaphor? The city is um, the lamppost, the streets dim. And in another line, the sky over us coquettes the skirt spleen, where coquettes is a verb in this context, but is not normally a verb. There is a sense that the word spleen may also somehow have a double grammatical function. What is a skirt spleen? It would seem to be either two nouns, one used after the other, or one adjective and one noun. Or is the meaning more metaphorical in the sense of a spleen is a skirt sky? What is clear is that the central lines of the poem are full of things which are in a state of negation, absence and unreality, and I quote, the signboard thinks it's the city's friend. If it gets unstitched by passers-by, seek, no city. It's just an absence of blue ley lines. That's why that one invaded, destroyed, measure as if it were a chimera. And don't seek. Why? There's a superabundance of usual caresses. The absence of blue ley lines connects with the line juggling the intersections of the city's dance in line four. The lines and attributes of the city are visible and invisible, apparent and absence. The line, it's just an absence of blue ley lines, is the central line of the poem. Four stops occur at the end of line two, though this is likely to be because an abbreviation is used, etc. And within line 15, but there is no closing full stop, and there is no question mark after the question posed from line 16 onwards. The meaning of the central lines of the poem imply that the passers-by unstitch the signboard and create no city, it's just an absence of blue ley lines. Significantly, there is a word in brackets, seek. Within this context, this word is a deictic, as in the sense of here it all is, this is just as it is, thus. But the brackets take the reader out of the text and closer to the poet. There is an implied encoder comment here. The poet can be seen as placed between the poem and the reader at this point. It can be argued that the central placing of this one word provides an axis or turning sensation to the images, and the line no city is a further jolt. jolt. Is the city real or not, or is it just the fragments which are real? One last exploration of the poem uses the Jacobsonian interpretation of iconic shapes within the poem. Here the words which denote squares are highlighted in green, that's boxes, rooms, car, truck and signboard, and the words which denote circles, everything, nothing, are highlighted in red. Wheels, sun, lump, no city, emptiness, eternity, eyes, O. Connectors have been drawn to guide the eye through the poem towards words which explore key ideas. Is it wider the mark to see how the upturned chair legs of line 19 are loosely represented? That this poem is an integrated expression of chaotic movement, as things turned upside down, at a truly futurist expression in words. This is a recent futurist style painting which includes a tumbling Viennese chair, just to illustrate this point. Lastly, all the shifters are shown in red. There is a nexus of deictics of place, over and by, used twice each around it, line 6 to 9, and all the deictics are shown in blue, and lines 15 to 18, and here the deictics are of <coughs> time rather than place. But the vocative, implied at the beginning of the poem and openly used in the last line, govern the poem. For Jacobson, the poem will demonstrate a structure which can be analysed with reference to grammar, linguistics and semiotics of verbal patterning. Is it really possible to apply principles which arise from Jacobson's later series to this poem written by young Jacobson and read here today uh, in translation of the Russian original? Can the shattered nerves, crazy juggling intersections, unstitched blue ley lines somehow be understood to iconically construct the mechanics of a city? Only the city ensued inhumanly. Or as Alan Fisher has asked with reference to his own work, of which more below, why does the end of the poem have to be read last? The process of the text may be more clearly understood with the use of a different sequence, and for that I refer to Scott Thurston's PhD on Alan Fisher. It can be argued that this poem by Jacobson 
responds best to being, to being read as bracketed by the vocatives at the beginning and the end of the poem. Encoder addresses decoder, and within this there is the chaos of the city. If shifters are usually considered to be a part of deixis, then it's worthwhile to briefly examine the history of the development of the deictic category. Carl Bühler, in his theory of language, places the shifter firmly within the deictic category. The origo deixis, that of the I within the here and now, and he has a diagram which he uses to interpret this, and he outlines a number of different categories of deixis, but for Bula, the origo deixis is the category which encompasses the shifter. He writes, My claim is that this arrangement is to represent the deictic field of human language. Three deictic words, words must be placed where the O is, namely the deictic words of here, now and I. The first demands look at me, an acoustic phenomenon, and take me as a mark of moment. As a mark of place, says the second, and the third as a mark of the sender. And I actually think that it's the other way around. I think that the first one is a mark of place, that's here, and the second, look at me, an acoustic phenomenon, take me as a mark of moment, that must be now. But I'll have to go back to the original for that. For Bueller, Deixis is expressed through the words which denote position, in front, behind, right, left, above, below, and so on. Although these largely fall into the category of adverbs in times and place, other parts of speech also denote deixis. And one of the things that I came up against when studying deixis is that people have interpreted deixis very broadly, so that even as you have full sentences, for example, the detective sits writing, the st secretary stands waiting, simply because you conjure up a physical juxtaposition of two people, uh, then the phrases have a deictic meaning, but I think that this loosens the understanding of the specific um, grammatical purpose of the deictic category, and it makes it too broad. Jacobson's understanding of shifters, written about 20 years later, describes the shifter I, has been, as has been shown, from the point of view of the context of the spoken word and reported speech. His emphasis is on the addresser, the code message and the addressee, rather than on the deictic place and time of the origin. This is in fact illustrated by Jacobson's vocative use in the opening and closing lines of the poem, which further complicate the poetic dialogue, for lovers and OU readily become we for the addressee or reader, and this specifically draws us into the chaos of the poem or message. In poetry, the translation from the I to you or vice versa is more readily made as poetry contains an element of the spoken voice through the heritage of recitation. Thus a poem where even the personal pronoun is omitted will contain the seeds whereby the reader or addressee translates the experience as his or her own. The reader of poetry is more than willing not to suspend disbelief as in drama, but to suspend differentiation in order to assimilate uh, the full impact of the poem. The poem invites us to be there and to experience the same experience that the poet describes, and this is seen as the valid purpose of the poet and the poem. Veronica Forrest Thompson, who studied Jacobson's paper on shifters, understood the artifice of deictors and shifters in poetry very well. Her analysis of shifters in Eliot's The Wasteland interprets her theory of the disconnected image prevalent in modern and contemporary poetry. Her analysis also provides a connection to the second part of Jacobson's paper on shifters, which is entitled Attempt to Classify Verbal Categories. She derives from Jacobson's work on participants, narrated events and verb tenses, an understanding that verbal tenses can shift in the use of verbs in poetry as well as pronouns. She wrote, A contrast between now and yesterday of five years ago in a poem does not lead us out of an empirical situation, but tells us that a temporal contrast will be an important device for thematic organisation, and the same holds true for reference to I, we and you. These oppositions lifted away from external contexts, limit the invasion of the external world and provide scope for internal thematic expansion. 
Jacobson's own analysis of shifting verb tenses is unfortunately not well illustrated with examples. Development of these categories is only briefly illustrated here, and with respect to poetry, it deserves more analysis elsewhere. And I think really I've said, I've said quite enough. Um, I did go on to make some points about the uh, shifting in verbal tenses in the Alan Fisher poem, and also on the clear patterning of Dakes's and shifters in the David Jones poem, and then I went on to um, cover the moving the good of the time with the iconic representation of my own poems from Shades of Light. Um, but I just have one last paragraph to summarise, and that is that theory and poetry can often seem in can often conflict in the sense that theorists prefer theory to poetry and poets prefer poetry to theory. The same problem can occur with linguisticians and semioticians. The two can seem mutually exclusive. Jacobson's theories bridge the gaps between these four categories. This paper has attempted to provide an analysis of how they might be combined. The use of semiotics in combination with linguistics gives rise to the study of patterns within poetry, a study of artifice. This arises from the literariness or science of poetics. This paper has indicated how this combination applies not only to different forms of poetry, but also to different genres of poetry. Here it is suggested that of the city, with special reference to shifters and deictics. This combination of theory is much neglected. The suggestion of a genre of city poetry is new. Thank you for listening. Any questions are welcome. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much indeed. I do have some questions. Good. Um, which, um, uh, May well be just my um, my difficulty uh, in comprehending a poem that I've not read before. But when you began, um, you wished to ins- to insert a um, shifter um, as a second word, you know, to guide us to the presence, if you like, of an implied shifter, um, and you related that to the shifter, which is present in the last line. Um, Now, I'm having difficulty in in, in framing my question, but let me put it this way. To whom is this poem, to whom or to what is this poem addressed as an act of what one might call apostrophe. No? To whom to whom is it directed? Or to what is it directed? Um, again, I may be slightly mesmerised by um, um, entirely irrelevant similarities to Elliot. But, you know, Elliot, oh city, city, I sometimes hear, you know, pleasant white in the man of and so on. Oh city, city. Um, is, the, is, is the Imply audience of the poem, the city. Well, I, th- I think I can't. I can't. I would be very rash indeed to give any categorical answer to your question. Um, and for me, that's why I find Jacobson's theories of communication function so fascinating because he validates the poetic text as a process of communication between the poet and the addressee. Um, This means that anybody reading or listening to this poem is the addressee. Of that there is no doubt. Which which is is not what I'm implying. I'm implying that on the one hand, you have an audience to whom the poem um, who are receiving the poem, if you like. But that the poem itself might be, uh, I call it an apostrophe, but you know, a, a statement directed towards um, the city. So that what, um, a, a, a statement, what we, we as readers um, are in the position not of those who are being addressed, for those who are overhearing something which is being 
um, addressed as an encomium or as a, uh, a statement to um, what on, on one hand is an abstraction city, but on the other hand, of course, as Phil Rath in the poem, is a, you know, a, a city which is both representative and an actual. Or, or am I completely misreading this? No, no, not at all. Um, I mean, I, 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 let me just say that I'm, I'm, I'm very struck by um, another factor that you pointed out, the absolute centrality in this of the shortest line. Um, and the relationship between no city there and OU city in the last line. So um, um, that, that return implies to me that, it, but it's only, you know, it's, it's, an, it's not an implication, that's wrong. It's an inference that I'm drawing that this is a poem addressed to the city, a city and the city, if you like, which I'm overhearing and in which I become intrinsically fascinated. Um, one of the things that fascinates me about it is its comparative absence of punctuation and therefore its reliance upon lineation to provide an implied punctuation. Um, if the full stop at the end of um, the second line is to be read merely as a sign of an abbreviation of etc. Uh, then we have only one punctuation mark in the whole poem, which is in the line why there's a superabundance of usual caresses, full stop. Um, again and again, is that why all the colours have flown off the people of this panel? And all that's left is the emptiness. Show your tickets. I mean, in a way, um, after emptiness, there ought to be a question mark. Surely, there's an implied question mark. Um, show your tickets flows on quickly as though it's a command overheard on a piece of public transport, um, a tram or something. Um, and, you know, one, one needs to. Um, it's a poem that can't be read, it's a poem that can only be reread, but it, it, it's. Um, I think you might see what I'm saying, that I, I wonder if it is um, a poem really addressed to. Yes, it is. Yes, and, that, and that's, you see, in that sense, I, I puzzle over um, the line, uh, the third line, along their shattered nerves like words or crazy verses, juggling the intersections, the city's nights. Dance. Now, as, as I read it, this is a sentence, a new sentence as I read it, um, which really reads, the city's nights dance along their shattered nerves, like words or crazy verses, juggling the intersections. Um, and I might be, you know, please tell me if I'm, please tell me if I'm absolutely wrong. Um, well, I, I, I think it, it's anybody's guess, and I think that the, the poem is designed for that. I mean, when I showed that diagram with all the different shifters and the words yes. highlighted in green and blue and everything, yes. the chaos is apparent. Yes. In a way, I kind of disproved my own... But isn't that the point? Yes. But uh, it's... Uh, he, uh, Jacobson says that vocatives are, are defined as decoder-oriented. In other words, that they are... Uh, projected towards the reader. It is for the reader. It's not something that refers back to the poet. It refers through the message to the reader. Um, and that, that actually is another process of disassociation. Because I, I think most clearly of all in the last line, oh you city and sued and you and me, then he is definitely addressing the city. But for you, in brackets, lovers of covered cardboard boxes, he's really addressing those of us who live in the city. So he, he's kind of shifted his ground yeah. Um, the lots of colourful books with coloured colourful books and powered elements. That group, whoever they are, 
the city, a land post, streets dim and a car's horn, the daughter of ruins, etc. Um, I, I, th I think one of the things, I mean, I didn't go into Jacobson's poems of language, but a lot of uh, modern poetry, and Anne Fisher's really is one such example, concentrates on metonymy rather than metaphor. So that when you look for the meaning, you look for a kind of accumulation or an agglomeration of meaning that arises from the words. It's not a, a process whereby you're looking minutely for punctuation and exactly which word applies to which uh, part of the sentence. You're looking for an atmosphere and tone which arises, um, because as in art, you're not looking at a, a specific photographic representation of an object, you're looking at attributes of the object. In futurist art, you're looking at uh, jagged senses of movement in the art. Yes, <laughs> and, um, and it, the same would be true in, in the use of words. Well, well I think, yes, I'm, but I also, you know, um, can I say, with shattered nerves <laughs> and, and um, car horns and lamp posts, you could be, you know, you could be in the hallway around here. <laughs> and it's, um, it's, it is, if you like, it's the sudden, um, it's the flood of fleeting impressions mm -hmm. um, that add up. It's the, it's the scattered fragments that add up to quote unquote the city. Um, and uh, no, it's um, again. Um, I think you know, I'm I, I no longer aware of the danger of, of reading this by TSA, unreal city and so on. But the reality of a city is made up of so many, um, so many shattered nerves, so many fleeting fragments. Um, the, this is um, this is well um, it's just an absence of blue light lines that's why that one invaded destroyed measure destroyed measure as if it were a camera well, measure is indeterminate. I don't know if it's a, a verb or um, a noun. But one of the things that, um, you see, uh, Jacobson specifically says that you must only look at the, the, the text as it is in front of you and what it rises from it scientifically, an empirical study of how it's constructed. But what I found frustrating. And, and so, uh, implying what, what is it? Does that imply that one mustn't do it? What it implies is that you mustn't um, seek to provide, uh, find biographical material. Oh, well, he's, he's written this poem which contains, let's say, for our a lot of reference to the colour blue because he was depressed at the time. That, that for Jacobson, is an invalid um, mm. construction from the poem. Um, so it ev evacuates intentionality. Yes. Yeah. I mean, very you, you, you mentioned this at the very outset, and I found myself writing down um, something about uh, about um, how biography might be. I think you said a false premise. <laughs> um, probably is the writers I tend to study are writers who rewrite and revise, so that a new text, um, in the process of disavowing a, a previous text, sorrow of love is a classic case here. Um, absolutely classic text, um, but the disavowal of an earlier text in a later text, as in Sorrow of Love, of course includes that disavowed text in the very thing um, which is being rewritten, and it's, it's only by relating um, the history of those texts back um, to um, the history of the texts themselves has a life um, which, in curious ways, um, both is and is not, you know, something that drags you back to an author, an actual author, an actual period. Um, and I, um, I, mean, I don't know if this poem, um, this is originally written in Russian, 
and only exists in this particular mm -hmm. form. It doesn't have other forms. No, he, he, stopped, he fell in love and stopped writing poetry. But manuscripts don't survive, for example. Mm -hmm. Or other post publication revisionary states. Well, I think Jacobson's argument is that you take the text that you have in front of you. Mm -hmm. And I, I think his analysis of Yeats um, includes his own literary literariness. Yes, I absolutely agree, but I think, it, I, I must say that it's very long time since I've read it, but very long time. But his, uh, his work is very dry. But it, it, it's very difficult. Yes, it's one of the, it, it's curiously enough it's a, it's the literature of the sorrow of love is something that I'm um, otherwise quite well acquainted with. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought it was one of the least nourishing <laughs> of any statements about the sorrow of love. And the most important thing about the sorrow of love, of course, is its relationship um, to the a school or the um, translations of the of, of Book One. Um, which he's, um, he's struggling with, so you know, the whole of the world's tears um, come from lack of my reverend, but later in life, when he's unhappy with the whole of the world's tears, it becomes the greatness of the world in, in tears. And then uh, he then has to unpack all of those illusions, do them like the pieces, and they make ships and so forth. And it's, um, it's one of those poems which um, is only actually explicable in terms. Um, of um, of Yeats's writing life, well, by which I don't mean Yeats's life, right. but I mean you know a a, a a a a series of textual dissatisfactions, um, and this is why um, part of my difficulty, you know, I understand um, and and have great sympathy with. Um, the imperative of reading an author on his own terms. You know? um, and um, reading, if you like, according to... I don't think the, you're necessarily reading uh, the author on his own terms with Jacobson's um, technique. I think you're reading the message on its own terms. Um, and I think that I, I would argue that what you say and what you gain from Yeats through other methods is equally valid. But I actually think that Jacobson reveals certain things that you would not otherwise see. What was frustrating for me, for example, with this poem was that I didn't, didn't know what he meant by ley lines. And I also didn't know why it referred to the signboard. Because I thought, well, does he mean a, and, an and what, advertising and what effect does it mean? Well, what I discovered um, by doing a small amount of research, the ley lines referred to um, a painting which was being, um, I don't know, where is it? It refers to a painting by Berliuk, exhibited in Moscow in 1912. Painting by? Berliuk. That's B U R L Y U K. And the ley line was a conceived according to the Assyrian method and the principle of flowing colouring. And um, so that immediately, actually, for somebody like myself, uh, reading this a hundred years later, it was actually quite interesting to understand that there was a, a reference to a painting, in this yes, a specific indeed. painting in this yes. poem. And uh, also the signboard d didn't refer to a reverse football. There was a very famous speech um, given by Lenin, made by Lenin to young people in 1920, which is a date contemporaneous with this poem. And uh, it uses the word in a very specific way. It's, and I quote, we have no need of cramming, but what we do need to develop and perfect the mind of every student with a knowledge of fundamental facts. Communism will become an empty word, a mere signboard, and a communist a mere boaster if all the knowledge he has acquired is not digested in his mind. So he's making a reference to a very topical and important speech that was made at the time. And it's a bit so like the way with all our politicians doing the cliche <laughs> like roadman. Uh, yes. So it was frustrating for me because I spent a long time just totally analysing the poem exactly as it arose from 
the text on the page and, um, in and fact, then the comments. yes so there was a lot more colour put into it because yeah. I had actually uh, looked into the background the artistic and the political yeah. background that was going on at the time which of course was very important in those days Russia was a time of in, in, but, then, in but then sorry to pursue this in okay. this way it's not meant to be relentless but uh, um, if you do accept that and I am of course myself absolutely predisposed to accept those those kinds of allusions um, to things outside the poem which um, make the poem more understandable. Aren't you then admitting biography? Well, all of, yes, well why not? But also why not have what Jacobson does as well? And I, I think that he is dry. I think that he's very hard work. Um, any analysis, of, for example, a poem of this length can take many, many hours. Yes. And also, I, I, I personally find that I change my mind during that process. Um, but it does release certain things about the poem uh, which you wouldn't get in any other way. Um, but I also think, uh, for example, I mentioned... Um, Christine Brooke Rose's analysis of Pan's Usura Canto, which is exhaustive. But personally, I think she loses the plot because what she does is that she goes into every single detail, all the different parts of speech, all the different grammatical categories, all the different tenses, and she draws up tables, it's all tabulated. And um, that's why I said in the beginning of this analysis um, that because there were a lot of nouns in the poem because uh, the poem is all about fragments and um, scatterings and disassociation. Then what I would do with the Jacobson technique is to examine those areas because they were obviously central of central importance to the poem itself. And I think what Christine Brooke Rose did was that she used the technique without ad attaching it to the meaning of the poem. You see does she ever, <laughs> does she ever, in her analysis of the UCR counter, refer to the experience mm. of? Oh God. Excuse, excuse me. Um, yes, I, I will be there in that. Um, I'll be down in a, a few minutes. Okay, it will take take me about ten minutes, and I will I will tell you. Okay, thank you. Um, Sorry, but I have a car which is apparently um, But no, does she, does she ever refer, ever, ever refer um, to the experience of hearing the hand read the poem? Because you, you know, the Azura Canto, in, in, uh, of all of the cantos, is one of the ones where one has an extraordinary chanting performance by Pound, mm -hmm. um, which is recorded and which shows him reading the poem. Um, according to various um, established theories uh, at the time on the chanting of poems. And it, it quite changes the way in which one, um, one receives yes, the, no, I, I accept that. the interrelations between the words and the poems. They say if you hear John Ashbury read his poetry, oh, yes. it's much more intelligible than when you I, read it. <laughs> I've heard Ashbury read it yes. uh, right here. And um, it, it is absolutely astonishing to hear Ashbury read, mm -hmm. uh, because one of the things Ashbury is extremely good at is, um, is adjusting one's, one's grasp to, um, well, to the extraordinary implicit paragraphing that, 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 that he can muster. Um, and um, yes, I also think, you know, with a far more simple poet, such as Wallace Stevens, listening to Wallace Stevens reading his poems, um, you know, is an extraordinary guide to them. Um, Eliot necessarily, and I don't think all poets necessarily are the best readers of their own poems, of course I don't, but um, nevertheless, there are some poets, you know, who, and Pound is a good example. Well, I think Christine Brookwright had a particularly detailed, um, slightly dry turn of mind. Yes. For example, she wrote novels with Yes. One or two vowels missing, or something. Yes. And she, yes. she did very peculiar things. Yes. Um, and I think that her analysis, but what she did prove was that you could use Jacobson's technique for free verse. 
which Jacobson himself had only used with traditional verse forms, like sonnets, for example. And, um, but I, I think Jacobson gives, gives you his own let out because he, he takes you towards the semiotic patterning. It's not just the linguistic, but if you don't concentrate on the linguistic thing, side of things, there are things that you will miss. And if you concentrate on the biographical background of a poem, there are, not, there are a lot of things that you will miss. Because it means that you're not studying the poem, you're studying the poet. Which, of course, is what you may want to do. Yes, no, no, I, I fully understand. I don't, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive no. at all. Two of the poems are mutually exclusive. I'm just, I, I'm struggling with a poem I've never read before. <laughs> 